Good morning, Transformation Church family and friends. Hopefully that by this week we've got some guests with us also. I uh, want to welcome you to our next edition of online church service. We hope you've got a comfortable place at home. Uh, you have your family and friends, loved ones around you. Uh, for us all, like that last song said, to come to the altar together, bring our sorrows, and trade them for joy. So uh, we welcome you to grab the elements for communion that will be later, uh, find a spot, and, and join with us. Uh, we hope that we can tell by this morning some houses all around the area are shaking from that musical worship, and now let's join in prayer and the word together. Um, you know, as Christians, we are not uh, stuck to rote prayers. Uh, Christ opened the veil for us to go directly to our Father. Um, but for those of you who are on the YouVersion Bible app, you may have noticed that we can uh, pray together uh, collectively, Christians all around the world, with some prayers that they have. And uh, this one I saw within the past uh, probably week, and it just seemed fitting because God will get the glory, and so let's join in prayer to that end. Dear God, you alone are worthy of all glory and praise. You are not shocked by the state of the world, and nothing is impossible for you. Today, we're proclaiming that you will be glorified through this pandemic. Your name will be praised throughout the earth. Pierce the darkness. Shine brighter than the fear of death, loneliness, or economic ruin. When we look back on this moment in history, would we be filled with joy as we remember the revival, hope, and peace that came from this season? Continue to draw this hurting world back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you, Transformation Church, and more importantly, he loves you. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Let's pray, family. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we give these next few minutes to you as we dig into your word. Lord, we pray that you will be glorified. I pray that I will be able to speak clearly your word. Lord, please hide me behind your word and behind your power. Please go forth. Holy Spirit, work on our hearts, work on our ears to hear what you have to say to your church this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, family. Um, good morning to everyone. Welcome to Transformation Church. Um, it is our mission here that we would make disciples, be disciples that grow in love towards God and each other. This morning we are going to still be looking at the accounts of the building of the temple, um, but however we will be talking about the wall today. By way of introduction, though, I want to talk about the fact that all of us have had things that we have protected and defended. We have all protected and defended um, different things in our lives. We're all familiar with this concept of protecting and defending. Um, if you, the reason why we're here today um, in our houses as opposed to gather together and worship is because we are attempting to protect and defend our health and others' health. Um, here's a pro tip for any young men um, that, are, that are watching today. Um, here's a pro tip for you. Uh, you must be a protector and a defender, meaning you should, you should uh, walk on the, outside of the, um, si on the outside of the sidewalk when you're walking a young lady down the road. If you're walking downtown, you need to be on the outside so that you can protect and defend. If, if a car comes and, uh, and hits you all, they're going to hit you first. Or, you know, whatever the case may be, this is a way that you can show some chivalry. Um, shout out to my big brother, uh, uh, Benjamin. We had an incident um, when we were um, probably 9 and 10, 11 years old, in which he protected and defended me. It's not my proudest moment. Um, we were on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, and yeah, Mike is laughing because he's heard this story, um, and we got jumped by three dudes, and um, you know, they were trying to shake us down. Do you have any money? So we was like, no, we ain't got no money. I think we might have had a dollar. We gave them that, and then it was like, well, take off your shoes, and my brother, he's a little older. He was like, no, I ain't taking off my shoes, and me, 
Again, this is not my proudest moment. I took off my shoes, right? Um, and my brother's like, what are you doing? Why would you take off your shoes? So my brother then picks up the shoes and we run. We take off running. Um, he was in that moment protecting and defending me. All of us know about this concept of protecting and defending. Um, if anybody has ever had, has anybody ever had to protect and defend a lie? That is another form of protecting and defending. You, you uh, have to get your story straight. You have to answer the proper way. You have to avoid certain situations because you are trying to protect and defend something. Last example. I just want to make sure that we all understand this concept of protecting and defending. Has anybody ever protected and defended against their own vulnerability? Um, if you watch any Hallmark movie, you will see a, a woman who's been hurt in a relationship at some point, and she's protecting and defending herself by keeping someone at arm's length. This may happen in a romantic situation. This may happen even in friendship. Um, the idea of protecting and defending. So we all should have a pretty good concept of what this protecting and defending is about. In the story today, we're going to see Nehemiah who had a vision, uh, a, a holy ambition to see Jerusalem rebuilt. Um, if, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you remember that we first talked about rebuilding the temple and how the exiles came home and they had to uh, make it a priority to rebuild the temple. But this week, before the temple got built, the first thing they did when they got back was they had to rebuild the wall. And in the midst of rebuilding the wall, um, this vision of rebuilding Jerusalem, they ended up having to protect and defend the wall because there were enemies that didn't want to see them prosper, that didn't want to see them um, be restored to their former glory. There were enemies of this vision of Nehemiah's to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. These enemies surrounding them were the Ammonites. It was the army of the Sumerians. It was the Arabs. It was the Ashodites, whoever they are. I don't know where these dites went, but I haven't seen too many dites walking around here. But there were a bunch of dites walking around back then, and they were plotting against Jerusalem. And what we'll see today is that um, Nehemiah had to employ faith and he had to employ a strategy in order to protect and defend the building of the wall. The main point of the text today is that when the enemy tried to stop the rebuilding of the wall, the people strategically protected and defended the project and had faith in God to provide his strength. What does this have to do with us? Well, for us, this wall represents the vision that God has for our lives. We, too, have a vision that we must protect and defend. This isn't a vision of what we want to do with our lives, but this is of the vision that God has for our lives. Just as God stirred Nehemiah with a vision to rebuild the wall and the city, God has also a vision for us, his people. We must protect and defend the vision that God has for our lives. So let's use a definition for vision today as the God-ordained will for us that is for our good and his glory. Again, the God-ordained will, Steve, that God has for your life that is for your good and for his glory. Now, again, I don't want to get it twisted with anybody watching. Um, the vision is not about our vision that we have for success or, or accomplishing certain things. But when we talk about vision today, we are talking about what God has in mind when he created you. Our good, his glory. So for us, the main point of the sermon today is that God will also help us as we use faith and strategy to protect and de defend the vision that God has given us. So we are going to be in Nehemiah chapter 4 today. It is, we're going to be covering a lot of ground, so we're not going to read it. We're going to kind of, um, we're going to walk alongside the text. And first we want to look at 11 um, takeaways from the story of rebuilding um, and protecting and defending the, the wall. We want to see what we can learn from that. And then we want to look at um, four visions that God has for our lives, actually five 
visions that God has for our lives. So if you would turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. Takeaway number one, where there's vision, there is an enemy. Where there's vision, there is an enemy. Verses 1 and 2. Now when Sambalat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? And so we see here that there is an enemy, and we're going to be reading about this enemy throughout this story, but there is a group of people that don't want to see the vision that God has placed in Nehemiah's um, heart accomplished. And it's the same for us when we have, when we want to pursue the vision that God has for our lives, we can expect an enemy. Who is this enemy? First Peter calls him the roaring lion, talking about Satan, Satan that, that wants to devour us. We, have a, we all have an enemy. We have an, an adversary is what the scripture calls it. So as you go towards pursuing the will of God for your life, know that you have an enemy that's going to want to come against it. Not only do we have an enemy from the outside, but we also have an enemy in our own flesh that wants to fight against the things of God in our lives. So point number one, where there is a vision, there is an enemy. So we can acknowledge that. Point number two, when you get serious, you can expect opposition. Let's look at verses six through eight. So we built the wall, and all, so we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. So they got, they got about halfway through the wall. They, it was built up to half of where they wanted it to be. And notice it says the people had a mind to work. So they were getting it. They had some consistency going with it. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. Again, this point is when you get serious, expect opposition. Notice they had started to make some progress. They had started to rebuild the wall because, remember, the wall had got shuttered. It was, it was a town that was defeated. Um, there were bricks everywhere. It was like um, it, they, were, they were conquered people. But as they got halfway through, now the opposition gets turned up. And this is the same thing we can expect for our lives. Have you ever noticed uh, once you start getting uh, really good into that weight loss plan and you've gone a few days without those carbs, all of a sudden you start smelling fried chicken in the air. All of a sudden you, you start seeing that Krispy Kreme and you say, I wonder if the light is on and it's hot right now. Or how about you may have a sin that you've been dealing with in your life and you're starting to get some consistency and saying no to the enemy and yes to the Lord. And all of a sudden the pressure gets turned up in your life. It's said to cause confusion in it. As we have our mind made up to do the things of God, at times, this is where the fight starts coming in. This is when the enemy starts um, plotting against the vision that God has for our life. Why? Because he is our adversary. Point number three, God can use our failures and our flaws. Let's look at verse two. It says, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in the day? Here's the key part. Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? So what they're, what they're getting at is that they're, they're, it's this, if you can get this picture in your mind of this wall that had been burnt, that had been knocked down, that had been shuttered, that had been in piles of rubbish, they were using these same um, bricks, these same material, this same mortar to rebuild the wall. And the enemy is saying, look at your failure. Are you going to still try to do this? Are you going to try to rebuild your life even though you have failure? 
But look what God says about us. Ecclesiastes 3 says, God beautifies everything in his time. What does that mean? He says, bring me those stones that have been burned. Bring me those failures that you've had in your life, and I will use that for your good and my glory. God can use those broken parts of us for his glory. I don't care if the enemy looks at you as you begin to um, move forward in the vision that God has for your life. He say, remember you tried that time and it didn't work? Remember you said you were going to be faithful in this area and you fell? Remember when you said you were living for God and you ended up living for sin? These are the burnt bricks in our lives and God is saying that I can still use those. Hallelujah. He will use our failures, flaws, and all. Even though the enemy will remind us of those. Point number four. Um, Point number four is they were prayerful and they were practical. Let's look at verse four. It says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are, capt- um, where they, where they are captives. Um, skip down to verse 6. Um, no, that's wrong. I'm sorry, guys. I see you on verse 9 right now. Verse 9. And we pray to our God and we set a guard as protection against them day and night. So what we see here is that they pray to God for their protection as they were going about rebuilding this wall to accomplish this vision. But guess what they also did? They also set up a guard. What does that tell us? That, again, even using this crisis as an example, we believe God and we pray to God, would you protect our people from this COVID? Would you protect our people? But at the same time, we're not going to put our people in harm's way. We're not going to tell them, hey, the blood of Jesus is over you. Now go shake as many hands as you want to. We're prayerful and we're practical. And this is the same thing in our lives. We, we, when we, when we go for God's vision in our life. We pray to God and say, God, would you help me with this? And at the same time, we put together an action plan. And we're going to look at that vision later on in the text. Number five, we must cover our weak spots. Let's look at verse 13. It says, so in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. So what's happening here is, remember, they are rebuilding a wall here. And so there were certain spots in the wall that were open, that they were were vulnerable. And so we must cut. What, What he did was he stationed people in those places where there were likely to be a breach. What does that say for us? That says, as we go about accomplishing God's vision for our lives, we must cover the weak spots. We must use our common sense. For example, uh, Pastor Jonathan, he he pastors at Hopewell Baptist Church. He used to be a member here. Um, He gave us a tip, and I shared it with Ben, I think, a couple weeks ago. He talks about how, um, you know, he's dealt with porn before in his life. And so one of the rules that he has is he doesn't take his telephone with him in the bathroom. Why? Because he's covering a weak spot. And it could be the same thing no matter what what weak spots we have in our lives, we must cover those weak spots. If, If you tend to get into sin because you're around a certain amount of people, then cut those people off. If you tend to not be able to handle the liberty of consuming alcohol, stop consuming alcohol. If you're around people that can cause you to sin in terms of what you put in your body, stop hanging around those people. If you have a tendency to be around a person that causes you to sin, stop hanging around that person. Jesus said that if your hand causes you to sin, to cut it off. And so what they were doing were covering our weak spots. This has a, a myriad of applications. If, if, if I'm trying to accomplish the vision of God in my life and there is a part that I am not good at, what do I do? I cover that weak spot. Number six, our faith is bigger than our fear. 
Let's look at verse 14. It says, And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers and sons and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And so what he tells them here is that, that we are not to be afraid of them, but to remember the Lord. So he was, he was basically telling them, as you see the people that are coming against the vision of God, do not be afraid of them. Think about who is stronger than them. We serve a God who calls himself the God of angel armies. Our God is all powerful. So when we go against opposition, when there are things in our lives that we are afraid of, one of the things we're going to talk about in terms of our vision is about being an ambassador. If we are afraid, for example, of what people might say when we share our faith, not being afraid of their response, but instead thinking about our God who is bigger and more important than those people or what their response would be. Verse 7, point number 7, the victory is not just for you. Let's look at 14b. It says, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. What does that mean? That means that we all have someone that we are influencing. There is somebody that is watching your walk with Christ and how you are stewarding your life for the vision that God has for you. Whether it is your spouse looking to how you walk with the Lord or whether it's your children that get to see an example of how it is to live and walk in the vision of the Lord or whether it is a coworker, there is someone that is watching you as you go about fulfilling God's vision in your life. And so as we walk in the vision that God has given us and we walk this Christian life, there are people watching and we get to show them how good our God is. And we also get to show them what it looks like to walk in his spirit. Number eight, we stay ready to fight. Let's look at verse 15. It says, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried the burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped to his side while he built. The man who, yeah, that, we'll stop there. So we must stay ready to fight. Notice there that they accomplished God's work, but they were also always ready for the attack of the enemy. And it's the same thing for us. As we go about living this life for Jesus, we must always stay ready in prayer. We must always be ready knowing that um, this isn't just a natural uh, fleshly existence that we have, but there is a spiritual reality to our lives. What does that mean? That we don't have just a ho-hum, everyday, daily existence, but we also know that we are in a war. We never forget that there is an adversary, and we never let our guard down. One of my internet heroes and mentors is John Piper, and he's talked about something like this before, and he uses the comparison of a ship, and he says that this Christian life is not a yacht, it's not a party boat, it's not a carnival cruise line, but instead it is a wartime aircraft carrier where we um, are always ready to go into battle. And our communication, which is prayer, is a wartime radio. And this is how we live our lives. We live our lives in such a way that we never get too far from our sword, which is the scripture. We never get too far from our communication with our general, with our God, which is the Father in prayer. We always stay ready to fight. Number nine, we need each other. Let's look at verse 
18b. It says, the man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and it is widely spread. And we are separated on the wall, far from one another. In the place when you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there and our God will fight for us. This is getting to the point that for them, if, if the enemy attacked, they wanted to sound that trumpet and all of them would rally together at this central point to fight. And for us, it's the same way. We must, as we walk this Christian life, we must rely on our brothers and sisters in Christ to fight these battles with us. We are not called to walk this life as a lone ranger on an island, but instead we are called into a community of believers that pray with each other, that call one another when we are low, that rejoice with one another. We always have to be able to think not only about ourselves, but, about, but also about our other brothers and sisters in Christ. We rely on each other and we need each other. Point number 10, God will fight for us. We actually just read that. That is verse 20. It says, our God will fight for us. Know that we are not in this fight alone. Not only do we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, but we also have Jesus intercessing for us at the right hand of the Father. And we also have God fighting for us. So as we go about this Christian life, as we go about the trials and um, the different different things, the different battles in our lives, we know that we're not in this thing alone. We've talked a lot about this fight. Point 11 is that God has given us superior weapons, more superior weapons than knives and guns. 2 Corinthians 10 and 4 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. We're not waging war with bats and with with, uh, shotguns and nine millimeters and so on and so forth. But the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. The weapons of our warfare. So we are also in a fight. We must fight just like they did, but our fight happens in prayer. Our fight happens in that we say, God, would you move in this situation? God, would you help in this situation? God, I need you to fight for me, for my good, and for your glory. Let's look at some more of the weapons, these superior weapons that God has given us. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10. Talking about the weapons. Finally, be strong in the Lord. That right there is a whole message in itself. Don't be strong in yourself, Ben, Kevo, but be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So again, we are relying on God's strength here. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Here comes the weapons. Stand stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. What is this truth? This truth is that this is the word of God. And the truth is what God has to say about your situation. 
What is this righteousness? This righteousness is that we have Jesus' imputed righteousness. We don't have to rely on our own righteousness and our own standing before God, but instead we get Jesus' righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. What does this shield of faith mean? This means that we believe God no matter what, that he is sovereign and that he will help us in our battles. That shield of faith is strong enough to extinguish every battle that the enemy throws our way. Every evil, every, every dart of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is the superior weapon that we have. That when we fight against the enemy, when we fight against the enemy that wants to frustrate the vision of God in our life, we use the scripture. This is our rock. This is our sword that we swing to protect and defend. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. So for us, the way we battle is in prayer. So we see that God will fight for us and alongside us as we strategically fight for the vision God has for our lives. So now what is the vision God has for you that is worth fighting for? What are, this, what are these visions that God has for your life that is worth fighting for? I'm going to look at uh, four today. Vision number one, that you and your household would serve God. Joshua 24 and 14, Joshua was talking to the people on behalf of God, and he says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you dwell. Here's the key part. But as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. So the first vision is that you would serve the Lord in your household. That starts with you. That you yourself will dedicate your life to the vision of serving the Lord. And then everyone that is under your influence. That is from your children. The scripture tells us that we should raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. That we should teach them about how great God is. That we should teach them the stories that are in the scripture. That we should teach them the laws and the commandments. Um, yes, uh, a few days ago, we're, we're doing something interesting during this lockdown, we decided to go through all of the movies of the Marvel Universe. And um, so we were looking at Thor the other night. And um, so we started talking about Loki because he was one of the main characters. And Loki is the quote-unquote god of mischief. And so we used that as an example around the dinner table. And we ended up telling the whole story of Jacob because Jacob, too, was a trickster. And so we were able to tell them that, and of course we were able to tell them the gospel at the end. But what was the point? We were as parents teaching our children the things of God. Even our adult children, they have a lives of their own now. But guess what we still are able to do? We're still able to pray for them. We're still able to encourage them. We are still able to model the vision of serving the Lord. So that is the first vision um, that God has for our lives. Number two, that you would walk in your calling. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That you would walk in your calling for the Lord. What this is getting at is the idea of um, you living your life for a purpose spiritually. Living your life for the master's use. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, starting at verse 4. It says that there are a variety, a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are a variety of services, but the same Lord. There are a variety of activities, 
but is the same God who empowers them all and anyone. Here's the key part. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So what is this saying? That everyone that is in the body of Christ has been given an assignment to do for his glory and in his kingdom. We saw the first part said that they, it can look a myriad of different ways, but you, should, you need to find a way that you could be serving the Lord. And it doesn't, it's not just um, public ministry. Maybe for you, your calling is to be a witness um, or a lighthouse at your job. Maybe your calling is to um, serve another person. You just should have a calling that is for God. Talk to the elders of the church if you need help figuring that out. Let's keep reading here. For to one is given through the Spirit. Through the Spirit, meaning that when God came and indwelled your heart with the Holy Spirit, he's given you a gift. The utterance of wisdom to another knowledge to another faith, to another gifts of healing, to another miracles, prophecy, spirits, various kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. Here's the key part. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. What does this mean? That means every single person in the body of Christ has been given a gift to use for God's glory. Everyone. So the number two vision that God has for our life is that we would walk in our calling. Number three, that you would be an active and and, an ambitious ambassador of Christ. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5 and 20. That you would be an active and ambitious ambassador of Christ. It says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we may become the righteousness of God. So this is the idea of the fact that all of us have been called to be ambassadors. What are you an ambassador of? You are an ambassador of the kingdom of God. Meaning that your home is in the kingdom of God where God rules and reigns. That is the kingdom that you are from, and you are living in a world that is full of darkness. You are living in a world of sin, and it is your job to be an ambassador that points to our God and say, be reconciled to him. Go into that homeland, which is the kingdom of God. That we would be an active, meaning that this is something that we do. Um, when, you, when you're an ambassador, you don't necessarily win every single person that you tell about the kingdom of God. But your job is to tell about it. About three weeks ago, I was sitting with um, a guy who was selling me an appliance, and we were talking about our faith. And he was a Muslim guy, and he was telling me, um, I learned something new, which I didn't know, which is that uh, Muslims trace their spiritual lineage from um, from, okay, Ishmael, thank you, which was the other son of Abraham. And I didn't know that. So they say, you know, um, so they're like, you know, we serve the same God. And I said, okay, yeah, you know, that's cool. But then I told him who Jesus was. And I told him about how Jesus died and took the punishment for our sin because we all mess up. We all do things against God's will and that owes us a debt and we've sinned against a holy God. And I kind of went into the gospel and, you know, I told him and I saw his eyes glazing over as I was telling him about this. Um, But guess what I did? I told him. And this is the same thing for us. We should find opportunities that we are an active and ambitious ambassador. What does that ambitious mean? That means that many times we will leave a social situation and say, man, I should have shared the gospel in that situation. But we got we to go to the next step and we got to open our mouths and we need to share. We need to be ambitious ambassadors of Christ. That's another vision that God has for your life. Um, Vision number four, that you would enjoy your life to the fullest 
for his glory. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 10. That we would enjoy our lives to the fullest for his glory. Verse 10, it says, I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better. Here's the key part. There is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat, drink, and take pleasure in all his toil, for this is God's gift to man. Now, what is this not saying? This is not saying that we just live our lives only for our pleasures. But what this is saying that we acknowledge God, we follow his commands, we live the life that he has called us to live, a life of righteousness and progressive sanctification. But what it also means is that God has given us the gift of enjoying the life that he has given us. Like we get to enjoy our lineage. We get to enjoy things um, like these Marvel movies that we're watching. We get to enjoy our families. We get to enjoy sports. God has given us everything freely to enjoy. And that is his vision for our life, that we would enjoy our life to the fullest. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you. Our elder Steve spoke about this a few weeks ago. Declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Where is the gospel in our passage today. And Mike, if you would come. The gospel is that the number one vision that God has for us is that we would be redeemed to him through his son, Jesus. That is his biggest, most grandiose vision that he has for everyone that is watching his life. His vision is that we would be reconciled to him. For we were separated because of our sin. We were separated because we broke God's laws. We didn't follow his commands. And our holy God does not dwell with sin. So it caused a separation for us in our lives. We, we racked up a debt that we couldn't pay. That was also going to send us to an eternal hell. But our God's vision is that he wanted to reconcile us to himself. So he sent his son, Jesus, who lived a perfect life without sin. And Jesus took the punishment for my sins and for your sins. And when he took that punishment, it allowed, if we believe on Jesus... If we believe what he did for us and we believe that he is Lord and Savior and we follow him, then we will be saved and our lives will be redeemed and we will be reconciled with our God. That is the biggest vision that God has for us. And if we become his, he too will protect and defend our salvation. There is nothing that will be able to separate us from our God. I want to end today by reading Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 29. Again, today we've talked about protecting and defending the vision that God has for your life, this vision of walking as saints. And we saw that when we believe in Jesus, he too will protect and defend our salvation. So let's look at Romans 8 and 29. It says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's talking about the saints in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those who he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. 
what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? This is Jesus protecting us, y'all. It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus, our God, will protect and defend our relationship with him. He has us in his hands, y'all. And the scripture said nothing is going to be able to separate us. So let's throw ourselves into the arms of God. Let's be strategic. Let's trust our God. And let's accomplish God's vision for our lives, family. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for the encouragement of your word. We thank you, Lord God, that you fight for us and with us. We thank you that as we go through this this Christian life, which can sometimes be hard and which we have an adversary and we even fight our own self, we thank you, God, that by your spirit and by your power, God, that we are victorious and that we are more, more than conquerors through you, Jesus. And even more than that, God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have protected and defended our salvation and that you, in fact, have drawn us to yourself. We thank you for saving us, Lord. So, Lord, I just pray for our family, Lord, all of the family members of Transformation Church, Lord. Lord, you know what battles they have in their lives. You know what enemies, what sins, what ungodly influences, what less than ideal circumstances that are going on in their lives. And Lord, we pray that you would fight for them. And Lord, that you would stir them, Lord God, to defend, Lord God, and protect the vision that you have, the will that you have for their lives, Lord. Don't let us live in complacency. Lord God, you said in your word that we are not ignorant of the enemy's devices. So Lord, I just pray, God, that you would strengthen us even as we go through this difficult season, this new season that we have going on in our culture right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those of you who have responded to Jesus' call to follow me and given your life to him, receive the salvation that is through the shed blood of Christ and made him Lord. We're now going to have communion together. And when Jesus was at the table with his disciples, Last Supper. Scripture says that he broke bread and he said, this is my body which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together representing the broken body of Christ. The word tells us that in the same way he took the cup, 
saying, this was his blood that just shed for us. And we know that only through Christ and his sacrifice and shed blood on the cross can we be forgiven of sin and have a relationship with God. Let's take the cup together. Father God, we thank you for your sacrifice on the cross given for us. We know that it is the only way to know you, to receive forgiveness of sin and eternal life. And we thank you that you have called us to faith in you. Father, we just ask that you would confront us those things in our lives that uh, are sinful and bring us to repentance, that we might honor you and that we might be fully available. We know that our very breath and life and all the resources that, that are in our hands are from you, that you are the source of those things. And so we ask, Lord, that you would give us an awareness of that we own nothing Father, the provider of all things in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And before we are done for the day, we want to uh, just give you an opportunity to give to the work of Christ and his kingdom, specifically here at Transformation Church. Um, the address of the church is 216 West Sock Trail. Uh, if you wanted to send an offering, we also have the Venmo app. Uh, so if you just uh, look on your phone, if you don't have the app downloaded for Venmo, and look up Transformation Church dash one. Transformation dash church dash one. And you can give electronically that way because um, the work goes on. And uh, just because we're at home doesn't mean uh, we don't need to continue to reach out to folks uh, with the gospel of Christ. So we encourage you to give and we thank you. Uh, also, next Sunday is Easter Sunday. So we encourage you to, um, in your families, in your, in your, in your, in, with your the people that you love in your home, uh, talk about that this week. Talk about um, Christ and look in the Scripture about the leading up to the crucifixion and the resurrection, and go through that with your family, and find ways to use this to teach about the significance of what happened at Easter. So thank you. Hope you have a great week. We're glad you joined us this morning. Thank you.